The sun set on the horizon and cast an orange glow over the vast expanse of the ocean. I finally arrived. I was the new engineer on the offshore oil rig Horizon Deep. I stood on the deck. I just enjoyed the fresh ocean air a moment. I couldn't understand my feelings. A sense of unease had gnawed at me since I boarded the helicopter to arrive. It was completely senseless. I'd worked on rigs before while going through college. It wasn't anything new. Sure, it was remote, but they were always remote. The rig towered above the waves. Everything appeared exactly as it was supposed to. The flight was uneventful. The landing was equally routine. This one was different. As much of an impressive feat of engineering as the Horizon was, it also exuded an eerie, almost ominous presence. The Horizon Deep was an ultra-modern rig. It had only been functioning for a couple of years. It was the safest and most secure rig of its kind. I'd spent months aboard ancient rigs like the Harbor Titan and Pacific Explorer. Rigs that had long passed their retirement age. Rigs that were decades old. Even they were far less spooky. I began to hear whispers about strange occurrences on the rig that first week. I chalked them up to superstition and the isolation of working in such a remote location. It was a hard life aboard these rigs. It wasn't for everyone. Gossip and superstition ran wild if the crew was inexperienced or bored. Still, I had to admit something about the place just felt off. The air was either too hot or too cold. The floors almost seemed to be at an angle. Some of the walls and fixtures looked crooked, even when they were perfectly plumb. I actually took a carpenter's level around after everyone else was asleep and verified the walls were plumb. They were. Mechanically, everything I checked was perfectly well within parameters. The crew was reluctant to be friendly for a while. I thought it was inexperience, but they were just hesitant to work with a stranger. I ignored their distance because I thought they were just a new crew. Everything cleared up by the second week. I discovered the reason for their secretive nature. I was in the control room with the rig's chief mechanic, Jake, during the third week. We were scouring some new readings and the lights began to flicker. I didn't think anything of it, but Jake sighed. Not again. I was as casual as possible when I asked, What's going on? Does power fluctuate often? Jake thought a moment before he replied, It's just the generator acting up. I knew something was going on, even if he wouldn't say it. I decided I would give him time to tell me without my prodding. The lights flickered again. A chill ran down my spine. I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I wasn't the only one to notice the change. Jake looked visibly tense. His eyes darted around the room, as if he expected something else to happen. Since there was no further anomaly, I didn't pursue the matter. I couldn't sleep that night. The wind howled outside, and the rig creaked and groaned with the movement of the waves. A new rig shouldn't be making those sounds. I got used to them during my time aboard the ancient gold vanguard. Sometimes it sounded like the whole rig was going to topple over into the ocean. I tossed and turned. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was standing nearby, like they watched us all sleep. Eventually, I rose up. I hoped to walk around the rig along with the fresh air would clear my mind. I made my way through the dimly lit corridors. I heard a faint, rhythmic tapping sound. It almost sounded like Morse code. I followed the noise. It eventually led me to a storage room near the engine bay. The door stood slightly ajar. It almost sounded like someone was hitting one of the support pipes with a pencil. I pushed it open and peered inside. The room was empty, but the tapping continued. It was much louder in here as it echoed off the metal walls. Hello, I called, but there was no response. I stepped inside. My flashlight cut through the darkness. The tapping grew louder as I went further into the room. The noise became more insistent, as if something tried to get my attention. I scanned the room, but didn't see much at first. Then I noticed the old oil drum in the corner. The lid sat slightly askew. The sound was definitely coming from that corner. The tapping abruptly stopped as I got closer. I hesitated. My heart pounded in my chest. I reached out and lifted the lid. The drum was filled with old clothes and personal items. That was bizarre. You didn't store personal belongings outside your room on a rig. You certainly didn't throw them in a metal drum and leave them out in the open. That could only mean these items didn't belong to anyone currently aboard. A tattered waterlogged journal sat atop everything. I picked it up and took it with me. Several pages crumbled at the edges, as if it had been underwater for months and only recently dried. 
I figured I'd ride through it and return it to the drum before anyone knew it was missing. Oil rigs didn't exactly come with libraries, so reading material could be scarce. The internet helped a lot, but internet on the rigs could be downright sluggish. I curled up with a book on my bunk. It was a daily journal for Thomas Hargrove, the former engineer of the Horizon Deep. His first mundane entries just discussed the daily operations of life on the rig and how much he missed his family. Something happened around two weeks in. The entries took a darker turn. Suddenly, Hargrove was discussing strange noises and shadow figures. He began to seem paranoid, as if management were in on some terrible conspiracy. He couldn't escape a malevolent presence that was on the rig. The entries grew more frantic, more desperate, until they abruptly stopped. So much for light reading. He seemed to think there was something down there. Something under the rig. He said they disturbed it when the rig began drilling and I wasn't going to let them operate. I also noticed that as his awareness declined, so did his mention of anything positive. He no longer wrote about his family or how much he missed them. He no longer discussed life at home or how much he missed his routine. He began discussing a strange tall man, a phantom that no one else seemed aware of. He said he had piercing eyes and was made of shadows. His very last entry ended with, He's coming for me. I pretended to sleep for a time until my alarm went off. As soon as I had a moment alone with Jake, I confronted him. I simply held out the journal. His face went pale. He glanced around nervously to make sure we were alone. Where did you find that? He asked, in a voice barely above a whisper. An old storage room below, I replied. What happened to Thomas? Jake took a deep breath and looked me in the eye. Thomas disappeared about a year ago. We searched the entire rig, but not a trace of him was ever found. After that, things started happening. Lights flickered, strange noises, equipment failed for no reason. Some of the crew swear they've seen a ghost, and they haven't been here but a couple of months. A chill ran down my spine, although I ignored it. Do you believe it? He shrugged. I don't know what to believe. All I know is that ever since he disappeared, this place hasn't been the same. We talked a while longer about it until lunch. That night I finally slept, but fitfully. I had vivid, strange dreams. Nothing in them made sense. I kept seeing an Collier-type vessel. I knew that had something to do with the situation aboard the platform, but I couldn't guess what. The next morning, between breakfast and the first meeting, I decided to explore the engine bay. Even if it all turned out to be nothing, I'd still need to familiarize myself with the rig's layout. Luckily, there weren't many workers in the area. They must have still been at breakfast. The bay was a confusing maze of machinery, parts, and pipes. The air smelled of oil and metal. The temperature dropped as I navigated through narrow passages and aisles. I knew something was amiss. The horizon deep was near Trinidad and Tobago. It was not a cold place. This was frigid. I reached the spot where witnesses last saw Hargrove. It was the middle of the floor. There weren't any openings to fall through into the sea below. There wasn't any dangerous equipment open nearby. I did begin to notice sound. It was faint. Something was whispering. It grew slightly louder as I stood there. I could eventually make out syllables, but not full words. A shadow moved in the corner of my eye. It was huge. I quickly turned the flashlight beam towards it. It was a tall, gaunt gray man. His eyes seemed to glow through the dark. My pulse raced, and a cold sweat formed on my body. Who are you? I demanded, as I tried to hide the tremble in my voice. The figure doesn't respond. To my horror, it stepped closer. I could feel its hate where I stood. The phantom's form shifted and flickered. I took a step back, but fear gripped me. It wouldn't let me move further. The whispers grew louder, until my head was filled with a cacophony of voices. Still, I couldn't understand what they said. The figure lunged at me, and I stumbled back. I fell to the ground. The shadows closed in, and a cold, clammy hand gripped my arm. I struggled, but it was like trying to fight off a nightmare. The world around me twisted and warped. I felt dizzy, like I had vertigo. Just as I thought I would be pulled into the darkness forever, his grip loosened and he retreated. The whispers faded and the temperature begins to normalize. I don't know how long I laid on the floor and gasped for breath. It felt like my heart raced forever. I finally gathered the strength to stand. I made my way back to the control room, still shaken and terrified. 
There was no fixing those errors. Jake was in there and looked like he'd seen a ghost as well. What happened to you? He asked. I saw him. My voice was barely a whisper. The shadow man. Mm, just as I said it, the alarms across all the panels began to blare. Pressure rose. Temperatures dropped. It looked like the entire rig would explode. His eyes widened. We need to leave. Now, he ran to the intercom and began ordering workers to the escape pods. It felt like forever before we had all the crew ready to cast off. I didn't exhale with relief until we were a hundred meters from the rig. I saw the strange shadow man standing at the rim of the platform. He glared at our boats. The rig suddenly exploded, and flames shot towards the sky. We all lost nearly everything we had on board. The rig continued to almost pulse with some kind of malevolent energy. We dealt with authorities when we came ashore. We knew no one would believe anything paranormal happened, so we simply said the controls went crazy. We couldn't pinpoint a source. Two groups of around a dozen technicians returned to the rig to evaluate its usefulness. It was declared a loss. Each of the salvage crews lost two or three people in freak accidents. Then, plans were underway to construct a new platform some distance away. I went on to another platform with the Horizons crew. As far as I know, no attempts were made to salvage the Horizons ruins. I know he wouldn't let them. I'm sure he's still there. Watching? Waiting? I still have nightmares about that night. About the whispers and the cold, clammy hand. I've tried to move on, but I know that some things can't be forgotten. The Horizon Deep will always be a part of me. A dark chapter in my life that I can't escape. We developed a theory. Although we keep it to ourselves, no one would believe us. There was an old collier ship, the USS Cyclops, that disappeared in that area. The wreckage was never found. It was last seen leaving Barbados near where the horizon was. There was wreckage of something down there, on the sea floor. I saw it on the scans. Management told us to just overlook it. It was just sea garbage. I think something happened aboard her. Something that plagues any vessel above that part of the ocean. For now, it's a mystery only known to us. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.